Welcome to our last webinar of the Innovative Pedagogies series hosted by Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or Branchette as we call ourselves. We're excited to welcome currently enrolled teacher candidates and minority serving institution faculty for our panel discussion today. My name is Kim Igwe, and I'm the Professional Learning Associate here at Branch Ed. Thank you for joining us. We're honored to have each of you here today, and I know you're eager to hear from the panel, so I'll share a brief intro to Branch Ed. The mission of Branch Ed, it is our vision to strengthen, grow, and uplift up lift up the impact of educator preparation programs at minority serving institutions as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure Americans' children receive the best education and support as possible. Today is the last of our 2021-2022 webinar series on innovative pedagogy. The intention behind this series is to inspire us all to think about educational practice through lenses which center and humanize historically underrepresented and excluded learners. We are excited to hear from our panelists who will share their authentic reactions to the innovative pedagogies presented throughout the series. Today, we welcome faculty and teacher candidates from three minority serving institutions to reflect, react, and join in conversation on our webinar series this school year on innovative pedagogies. Before we get started, let me introduce all of our panelists. Um, first, from the University of North Carolina, Pembroke, please welcome Dr. Tiffany Locklear. Assistant Professor in the Teacher Education Program at UNC Pembroke and a proud alum of the school receiving both her undergraduate and graduate degrees from UNC Pembroke. Dr. Locklear, um, when she's not teaching, is a mentor for the First Americans Educational Leadership Grant Program in which she supports aspiring American Indian administrators in an effort to increase the number of highly effective American Indian administrators and improve educational outcomes for American Indian students in North Carolina. Dr. Locklear is also the chair of the State Advisory Council for Indian Education and serves on the leadership team of Unlocking Silent Histories for the Lumbee community. Thanks for being here, Dr. Locklear. Leah Locklear, no relation, is a teacher candidate in the School of Education at UNC Pembroke. Her estimated graduation date is this spring 2022. Early congratulations, uh, Ms. Locklear. Her certification area is elementary education with a concentration in reading. Leah has received several scholarships to include the Friends of the Library Scholarship, and in her spare time, she loves to color. Next, representing Texas Women's University, please welcome Dr. Amy Myers. Dr. Myers is Assistant Professor of Curriculum and Instruction at Texas Women's University. In her research, Dr. Myers focuses on culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogies. Her current research project focuses on supporting critical literacy with refugee and immigrant secondary students. Most recently shared, um, Dr. Myers most recently shared her research at the International Conference on Urban Education National Council of Teachers of English and the National Association of Multicultural Educators. Before entering academia, Dr. Myers had 15 years working in education, including working as a secondary public school English teacher. And um, welcoming a teacher candidate from Texas Women's University, welcome Michaela Flores. Ms. Flores's estimated graduation date is spring 2023. Her certification area is in English 7th through 12th grade, and she is a first-generation college student. Thank you for being here, Ms. Flores. 
And to round out our panel of warm welcome from our guests from Pacific Oaks College in California, joining us early on, the, on that coast, uh, Dr. Jarrell Hill. Dr. Hill is the Dean and Assessment Coordinator in the School of Education. His areas of research interest include adverse childhood experience, student motivation, educational administration, special education, and urban schools. His professional memberships include the American Education Research Association, California Association of African American Superintendents and Administrators, and the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies. Now that we've introduced our panelists, we would love to know more about you, um, our viewers. In the following poll, please share your role with us as, before we get started. Great, I'm seeing we have some educator preparation program faculty members here. Thank you for joining us. I see we have a couple of um, K through 12 teacher uh, or leader administrators. Thank you for joining us. And a couple of teacher candidates. So we are representing everyone in the room today. Thank you all for being here. We know it's a busy time of year and we are excited for everyone in the room to um, dig in um, and reflect on um, our webinar series from this last year. Um, to start, I'd like to discuss more broadly the topic of the series on innovative pedagogies. What makes a pedagogy innovative and why are innovative pedagogies needed? Dr. Hill, can you start us off? Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And again, thank you to Branch Ed. I just always like to start with gratitude for uh, being with Branch Ed and all the work that you all do. Um, you know, I think to really talk about it in a broad sense, uh, what makes a pedagogy innovative is we have to possess the ability to create a classroom that students can't stop talking about. And what I mean by that is it really does open us up to new and transformed consciousness for all people, right? I think classrooms should be filled with teachers that believe all children can learn. And then we have the right to enjoy culture and really celebrate diversity. And what I mean by that is not just counting people based on their ethnicity, but making sure that they count. And I think that really does um, lend itself to what makes a pedagogy more innovative, right? Also, we have to look back, but think forward because there's things that have worked in the past, starting with gratitude, you know, centering everyone's humanity with that critical humility, but also, you know, possessing um, the ability to create that safe space for students to really engage within that environment. Um, so I think that really does kind of set the tone for what you know, innovation needs to um, look like in terms of pedagogy, which, you know, is the art of teaching is like, how do we teach? And really, we're teaching with the learner in mind, right? Because then that's really the idea of this innovation. For our panelists, would anyone like to thank you, Dr. Meyer? Yeah, just to kind of add to that, um, I also am very appreciative for this opportunity for us to not only share our thoughts and be able to use our voices as faculty members, but the fact that we have our teacher candidates here, because sometimes I think that we don't always include our stakeholders in these conversations. So I'm a super appreciative to Branch Ed that you're including them in the conversation. Just to add to um, Dr. Hill and what was said, I think innovative pedagogies for me also encourage students to find their own agency. I think that that is a big component of it, that it empowers our students um, to not only find agency for themselves, but also to find agency for their community members. For either of our teacher candidates, can you share your thoughts on innovative pedagogies and how you've either experienced them or how you hope to share them in your own teaching? I would like to share that as our natives, 
sorry, our native worldview is equally important as the non-native worldviews, thus the theory of regarding innovative pedagogies of culture and learning has the potential to enrich the history, heritage, and culture of native communities to equip the younger generation to know that really and truly anything is possible. And for me, as I'm as I will get my classroom very, very soon, my desire is to be able to prepare all my students, including the American Indian population, for a global competitive world and to prepare them for really and truly the real life. Hi, um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so when I think of innovative pedagogies, I think of creating a inclusive learning environment for everybody um, to have the same ground, like starting point, and everybody can move up at the same um, at the same pace or at their own pace. Thank you all for kicking us off on um, our first question. Would love to move to um, Dr. Gregory Cajete, um, which relates a little bit, Ms. Locklear, to, to your, um, what you just shared around Native American um, pedagogy. So in the fall, uh, Dr. Gregory Cajete kicked off our Innovative Pedagogies discussing um, series discussing indigenous pedagogies and discuss more um, discuss important topics related to American Indian education. In his presentation, he highlighted the need to be aware of the community, language, and culture of students and explore ways we can sustain tribal ways of knowing and reclaim our educational ways. What does this mean to you? Um, your educational experience your future or current classroom or your community. Dr. Locklear would love to have you start us off. Absolutely. So just to echo everyone else, I certainly appreciate this opportunity from Rent Ed. Um, as mentioned in my bio, my educational experiences have been molded and shaped in the community that I've lived in my entire life. Um, I've been a student, a teacher, and administrator within the school system before moving to UNCP. So claiming educational ways for me means everything and really provides assurance for the work that I'm doing in my very own homeland. Um, it is recommended, and Dr. Gregory mentioned, that Indigenous communities should take the lead in identifying the most important and appropriate curriculum for our youth. Um, Four other scholars and I really aspired to do this um, with much resilience, innovation, self-determination, and lots of community service. <laughs> we created an educational model most, most appropriate for the place in which we live, and we started a public charter right across from UNCP campus. We designed our own um, educational framework, which really allows us to provide those authentic and novel learning experiences and to do so for multiple worldviews and curriculums. Um, of course, this is aligned to our standard course of study um, and we just infuse this place-based education. Um, we can integrate this in very meaningful, relevant ways. Um, you know, we always say and note that the academy is open to all students, but it's equally important to note that the academy is in rural southeastern North Carolina, um, right in the middle of indigenous communities. So the educational model is designed for a student population that's rural, underrepresented, and defined in educational jargon as underrepresented or disadvantaged. Um, as a professor, this work and the representation in the School of Ed really matters. Um, while teaching and inspiring educators, it's important that they go in the field feeling confident, committed, and connected to the teaching and learning that they're going to do. do. Miss Locklear is going to have her very own classroom in August. How exciting, right? Ms. Locklear, can you talk about what this means to you? Do you feel prepared to connect culture and learning in your very own classroom? Hi. I do feel prepared. I feel like USCP and just different things that have allowed us to go and be really prepared, like 
and right now I'm finishing up my student teaching and with my student teaching there are just all these different things I'm like okay let me think back let me go and pull this resource and this resource to be able to help me to connect with all my students and that's what I'm really and truly grateful for and really and just like okay gosh it's going to finally hit me that I'm really about to be a teacher and have my own classroom and utilizing the resources that I was provided to be able to make my students feel welcome and to know how to deal with different things. And we really want to encourage our teacher candidates to think beyond traditional classroom structures, right? So in one of my classes, Leah got, Leah got to participate in a talking circle in which we read a book and then we unfold that, that rather than us sitting in rows and desks. So um, our teacher candidates, candidates have had experiences and opportunities to, to um, see a classroom unfold that is not a traditional education structure. And also, I'm going to piggyback off of that as just instead of sitting at the desk, even this week, when instead of sitting at our desk, I said, okay, guys, let's get on the floor, let's get on the circle. And of course, I did that. I said, crisscross applesauce. And that's what we did. And you're engaging the students and you're like, okay, I'm going to go home and tell whoever I live with about this. And they did. <laughs> so just having that and not having the traditional ways of a classroom. Thinking outside of the box. I appreciate the work that you all are doing and that you're sharing that with teacher candidates. My grandmother was a tribal citizen and dropped out of school in eighth grade. And a big part of that was because of the traditional ways that schooling has been done that just disregards the knowledge and the wisdom of our aunties and our grandmothers. And, you know, I am a huge fan of that perspective sharing that happens in the circles. You know, um, I know that there are so many people that it represents those four winds, right? North, South, East, West, and we're all a North, South, East, West person. And it's important that if we're a South person, we listen to someone who's a North person. Um, and, you know, those are things that were valued during that time frame, And that really impacted um, not only her progress within education, but it just stopped it completely in the traditional form. Um, she was one of the smartest women I've ever met in my entire life. Um, and so it makes me happy to hear. And it also makes me sad that those things, um, the work that you're doing wasn't done back then. Um, in March, we heard from Dr. Tyrone Howard and Dr. Carrie Ulishi on the topic of pathologic, pathologic poverty. Sorry, y'all, it's a tongue twister for me, always has been. Um, they discussed the myths regarding poverty in the United States, and in particular, the myth that schools are neutral. In what ways are schools not neutral? And how can innovative pedagogies make positive impact uh, for students. What role do innovative pedagogies play? Um, Dr. Myers, can you continue on? You started it off with this last uh, question, but would love for you to continue on thinking about um, and sharing your insights here. Sure. Um, you know, I think it was Desmond Tutu that said, um, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you're taking the side of the oppressor. So even if teachers um, or educators or administrators consider themselves not political, you're being political um, by not advocating for your students and ensuring that equity and inclusivity is happening in the classroom. Um, I really think when we look at the work of Paulo Ferreri, he brings to our attention that um, when politicians or leaders really don't want critical consciousness happening within the classrooms, it's because they don't want our students to learn how to question and to interrogate and to push back against the status quo. Um, and that becomes a huge issue because we're a democracy and to have democratic citizens participating in our progress, we have to have citizens who know how to question and to interrogate. I think um, when we're looking at innovative pedagogies, you know, one of my favorites is Chicana feminist pedagogy, um, critical pedagogies, culturally staining pedagogies. Um, I think those types of pedagogies 
really help push back against the ideas like meritocracy and Arne Duncan's no excuses policy. Um, you know, I have a lot of people in my own life who struggle um, with all kinds of oppressive barriers in their life, but they were never taught to question. They were just assuming that it's because I didn't work hard enough or I didn't pull myself up from my bootstraps. And um, I know how painful that is for them. And so, you know, sometimes you just see a wave of relief over students when you share with them that it's okay to question. And um, some of us are struggling because of things that were out of our control. And I think it's really important to also recognize that um, we need to know who our students are. Um, Michaela and I have talked about this previously, so I'm not sharing anything that she's not prepared to talk about too, and I'll give her a second here, but Michaela and I both come from poverty. Um, I have lived on food stamps, I have lived in government housing, and when you're a teacher education student or a college student and your professor is talking about poverty as if you're just a statistic or paragraph from a textbook, that is painful. Um, and it's silencing. You feel like you can't say anything about your lived experiences that might push back against what this textbook, this scholar says. Um, and I think that it's really, really important that we recognize that there are instructional strategies that are damaging to our students who are living in poverty. Privilege walks are a perfect example of that. I remember the first time I had to participate, I was required to participate in a privilege walk in college. And when everybody else was at the front, I was way at the back and I was used as an example to teach the privileged students about poverty. And I just, I went home and bawled that night, but I didn't feel um, empowered enough to say something at the time. And so I think that, you know, when we dive into frameworks that revolve around things like Chicano feminist pedagogy or culturally sustaining pedagogies, it allows us to kind of open our eyes to the things that might be damaging to our students. Um, Michaela, is there anything you would like to share? Yes, um, uh, like Dr. Myers mentioned, I do come from a background of poverty. I am I'm a first generation college student, so I'm still uh, under that poverty line. And um, uh, luckily for me, college has been very helpful. But in high school, I we just uh, me and Dr. Myers just talked about this yesterday. I was not able to get help um, until I turned eighteen. Was able to do it for myself. And then um, I remember in eighth grade, we we're doing public speaking and we were asked to pick topics over um, something that we can make an argumentative speech about. And I remember going to my teacher and asking if I could speak about poverty um, before anybody else. And what I did was I gathered a list of statistics and I just did that and I gave a speech and I think I mentioned the statistics once or twice, but um, I remember like that's how I took ownership of being used as a statistic in the classroom. And then once again, my senior year of high school uh, for our senior, um, I, for our last senior papers, we had to find a specific quality of poverty to write an argumentative paper about. And I, it was mortifying because I went to a, a pretty privileged school. I was a minority in a pri privileged school. So it was mortifying for me to hear my peers um, use me as a, an example. I remember one time one of my peers asked me, um, have you ever seen a hundred dollar bill? I was like, well, yes, I have, <laughs> and I've seen how fast it can go. <laughs> and so part of the neutral classroom, it um, didn't stop those stereotypes from being applied and um, elaborated within the classroom. And as a student, it was, mm, it made me feel ashamed to go to school. And um, I think the whole neutral approach is more damaging than it is meant to be helpful for students.
And I think to kind of add along with what Michaela said, I think during the webinar, the kind of light bulb moment for me was when they mentioned how a lot of people will say class or poverty cuts across demographics. So, you know, no matter the race, no matter what, there's poor people. And I was like, I have, I have heard that so many times, even from people who I love and I truly care about. And then, you know, I think it was Tyrone Howard who said, it's so important for us to recognize that yes, it does chronic cut across demographics, but people of color and women are much more at risk of being in poverty. And looking back on my experiences as a single mom, you know, I was in devastating poverty while um, my daughter's father was just living his life and going on. Um, and so it was kind of that moment that kind of kicked me in the stomach, I think personally, but also how important it is that we look at the sub demographics, the subgroups when it comes to poverty. Yes, um, the, Dr. Howard talked a lot about the stereotypes. Um, and I remember I've had many teachers say, or not specifically to me, but when talking to the classroom saying that, oh, you just have to pick yourself up or you just have to, um, you just need to work hard. You need to finish school and work hard and then you'll pull yourself out. Um, but if you don't work, then it's your fault that you're there. And that was really damaging for me to hear because it was like, well, what if I do the work and there's still no opportunity? Um, so, uh, yes. So one of the things that we do in class with Michaela's class in particular, we're using the simulated reality avatars um, to have the student teachers, the teacher candidates work with students who are avatars. Um, and they really enjoy it because it gives us the opportunity for them to try different types of pedagogies and different types of teaching without damaging real people, real young people, real adolescents. And it gives me the opportunity to say, okay, let's reflect over that. How could we have handled that differently? Um, and that's been really, really good, I think, for them when it comes to practicing different types of critical pedagogies, because it's not always something that comes natural because it wasn't something we experienced in our own education. I think that takes us to our next question. Um, so in April, we heard about Afrocentric pedagogies from Sharif al Meki, where he highlighted the Afrocentric belief that the mentor finds the mentees instead of the other way around. In other words, it's the responsibility of the teacher to seek out or find their students. He also highlighted the tradition of teacher as learner. What implications do these Afrocentric practices have for faculty, leadership, or PK through 12 educators? Dr. Hill, do you mind kicking us off with that? Yeah, I think that that's so important. I do so respect the scholarship of Sharik El Maliki. I think it really um, does help me center the work around some of the pillars of Afrocentric, which is really, it's, it benefits all people, but it really talks about the community, home, and family. And Dr. Thomas Parham's work teaches us that our job is to reconnect that triangle. Um, I think it really is centered around uh, one of the my favorite African proverbs talks about if a child is not embraced by the village, it will burn it down to feel its warmth. Right. So when we talk about classrooms that, you know, we need to say, I see you, I hear you, I love you. And that's really grounded in that work of being more Afrocentric. It is community. Right. It, I think it's more of information sharing, right? Because I think that's what it is. I think Sharif, uh, Sharif El Maliki said that we're going to be ancestors one day, so act accordingly, right? So it's so important that we impart um, those values and customs to people to form their, you know, positive identity. Um, I like what, uh, is it Malika? I think she mentioned uh, the parts of poverty, right? I think that's a part of not being taking victim. We're taking victory over circumstance, right? We're not gonna be victims, right? There's a difference between a handout and a hand up. And that's really centered in Afrocentric pedagogy. Um, I, I think the other part that was so important was that there's two things when my, my, one of my other favorite proverbs is we talk about there's two things that we wanna to impart to children. 
One is roots and the second is wings, right? Because if you produce excellence, it will bring opportunities, right? And I think that's so important. Um, the other thing that's really grounded in this work is one that there's really, I really wanna try to simplify because it was so much being given. I think the first piece is our intellectual capacity. You know, you have to have the subject matter competence to teach. The second part, you have to have critical humility, and I invite you to see the scholarship of Yolanda Silly Ruiz, who's really wonderful um, with that work. Um, thirdly, it's our critical consciousness, and we know about W.B. Du Bois talks about the double consciousness. Sometimes it's your identity because, you know, Dr. Joseph L. White talked about we're in a space that we don't control. So that double consciousness is like, well, do I take my identity or am I centering myself in positionality to a Eurocentric dominant culture? Um, the last part is being self-reflective. What can I do where I am? And that's Toni Morrison's work, where it's like, well, I have to be really reflective in my own work. Am I helping my students be all that they can be? Am I centering their cultural ways of knowing? It's not just enough to look like them. It's more so understanding how they learn and how they view the world. And one thing that I do want to underscore with our Afrocentric pedagogy is the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, if you've heard the say her name, she's really the architect of naming things. She says, we have to give things a name so we can frame it. And it really does hit on intersectionality. Um, when you talk about Afrocentric pedagogy, we're doing it. When you say, oh, I'm standing in solidarity, that's all Afrocentric community building, right? Because what happens is we, we try to eliminate this colorblind ideology, right? Because it makes people invisible. But I think the other piece to the color blindness that happens is when we close our eyes to facts, we learn them by accident. So all of a sudden we think that we're bumping into things that have already been here in a foundation, right? That's the point of having that counter narrative, right? So the intersectionality is like, let's elevate those other voices um, in the work. And the other thing that I, I wanna say about this too is it just reminds me of standing in solidarity or building community is uh, Chief Joseph Seattle, and he said, we don't only inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. So it's so important that we have to do things to make things better. And history gives us all that responsibility to right the wrongs of the past. And I think with uh, Sharif El Maliki, he talked about Frederick Douglass saying agitate, like being an agitator, right? Because that, that's a big part of it. It's like, I'm okay being uncomfortable. That's a part of having what Chris Emden calls the reality pedagogy into the work. I'm okay being uncomfortable because that, that's a part of my job, right? Mentorship is scholarship, and that's Kevin Coakley's work, where my mentors always say, you know, don't thank me, go help five other people. And that really is the work of thinking back but looking forward. What can I do to help these other individuals achieve their goals? But also making the time for your mentees as we're busy, because sometimes it doesn't take very much, right? Because I don't want people to go on a long journey. I can share my own story. My One of my mentors, Dr. Parham, wrote my career plan down on a napkin, but it took me 15 years to process what he was trying to get me to see. My goal with people is to make sure it doesn't take them that long to realize their potential. I love that we don't see our students as a collection of deficits. We see them as a combination of possibilities and really creativity. And that's how we really center this humanizing pedagogy, which is grounded in Afrocentric principles to really help students thrive. Um, the other thing I think that, you know, Sharif El Maliki wanted to underscore was it's the power of tomorrow, right? Because I know that, um, you know, George Washington Carver says, you know, without vision, there's no hope, right? And we know that, you know, the body keeps score, but the spirit does too. In the early 60s, uh, Dr. Cornell West talked about it was a melting of the spirit. And then when we fast forward to 2017, 2018, we know, you know, I so respect Bettina Love and her work, and she talks about the spirit murdering. If I murder your spirit, it doesn't matter what your body is doing. So that's why it's so important for us to have this positive self identity. It's an identity formation that has to happen with the students so that no one can talk you out of your culture. But again, having Afrocentric principles, it's about inclusivity, right? It's refocusing our lens and widening our circle. It's not about being anti-white. It's just centering your possibilities of who you are and what you're designed to be. 
Um, and the last thing I think I really want to um, highlight here is that I think we need to understand that history is not too far behind us, right? I think it's, you know, Cornell West says it's the urgency, the fierce urgency of now, right? Because we can't keep waiting. Well, how long do we have to wait? You know, it's, it's kind of in the words of the poet um, June Jordan, she says, we are who we've been waiting for. So we keep, we, we, we are, we are it. So in that sense, that really does kind of tie all of those things um, together. And I think the other part of a positive identity is really tied to one of my other favorite African proverbs. If there's no enemy within, the enemy on the outside cannot cause any harm, right? Because once I know who I am, I'm not gonna misbehave. I'm not gonna have these problems that people are trying to project on me. Remember, poverty is not fixed. Poverty is just a, a, a situation or a circumstance that can change over time. And we call, you know, in Afrocentric pedagogy, we call critical resources, education, op economic opportunity, but also our social political consciousness because that's grounded in the work of the warm demanders that Judith Kleinfeld and Gloria Latsing Billings talks about. Those warm demanders that it's the tough love that can recorrect your behavior, right? That's a part of the being a mentor. A mentor is not always a friend because they're trying to get you to the next level, right? So I think that really, really sums as I get really uh, passionate, but I wanna be mindful of everyone else on the panel. I appreciate your passion and I really appreciate what you said about mentorship is scholarship. Um, academia does not recognize the amount of work we put in. I think I'm about to cry <laughs> um, because we pour so much of ourselves into our students. I'm sorry. And, um, you know, at TWU, we're a Hispanic serving institution. And there are times that I'm like, where's the serving part of this? Um, and so uh, I helped start a program called the Latinx Juntos Mentorship Program, where students can request a mentor who comes from the same background as them. And they can ask for specific areas like linguistic, um, economics, um, sexuality, all those different things that they might be dealing with um, as a Latinx student that we can connect them with someone who has a college degree and who has already gone through these waters and who can help them along the journey. Um, and our volunteers are amazing. Our mentors are amazing. And they don't get the recognition that they deserve because it's not considered scholarship. And, you know, one would hope that minority serving institutions would recognize these more culturally, you know, sustaining um, ways of doing scholarship that are outside of the um, very Eurocentric approach to what is scholarship. So thank you, Dr. Hill. You know, you know if I can add to that, I, I really appreciate you understanding that, but I think that's the part of, you know, you know, agitating, right? I think that's something too, where, you know, I think as a Dean, I always tell faculty, it's my job to create the space for you to do what you want to do right and well, right? Because then I think that's a part of how do we center that mentorship as scholarship? Because it, like you said, it's your, you're putting your whole self into someone else, right? I think that that just reminds me of um, one of my favorite quotes from, you know, Dr. King. And I think people paint him as this marshmallow figure, but he had a 37% approval rating. He was an agitator. He wasn't just fluffy. And he says, you won't remember the words of your enemies, but the silence of your friends. So what happens is people in the academy stay silent and they know how impactful that mentorship is scholarship. As your assistant professor through a tenure track, there requires some mentorship for you to navigate that space. When I hear about first gen students, it's really access, access and opportunity. They just need to know how the, the system works, right? There's a difference between a hand up and a hand out. That's a part of equity. Equity is probably our best equalizer because then that helps us really talk about those things. And when we talk about reimagining and transforming education, that's a part of the transformative process. It's like, let's put that mentorship as scholarship so that people value in putting into others, right? Because I'm really a product of good mentorship and I know I'm standing on their shoulders. I, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have those mentors that 
saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. I had no idea I'd be doing this job. I trust me, I, I just, I couldn't have thought of this. I couldn't have painted this. That's a part of what Dr. White would always say is keep the faith. And he would put us on his freedom train. And he says, well, once you get on the freedom train, you have to go get other people to get on the train with you, right? So yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I just wanted to mention one other thing is, as we talk about these equitable practices and developing that agency and critical consciousness and self-identity, we really empower our students to find voice and, 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 and to lead. And, um, and that leads to us implementing intentional practices. I think it's really important that we're intentional about the way we open a space for teaching and learning. And, and when we design those lessons that are intentional, then the power of being connected and being relevant really begins to unfold and allows our students to really make those connections with teaching and learning. You know, we've looked at the data for years and years and years, right? We know there's a misalignment of the curriculum. We know that we understand that, but what are we doing? And so going out and being intentional about our practices is so very important. It's okay for us to talk about it. And it's not just the work of black and brown folks. It's the work of everyone, and we should all be intentional about connecting culture and learning so that this world becomes a better place. In discussing that partnership with uh, student and faculty, one way Branchette is thinking about innovative pedagogies is through our pedagogical partnership pilot initiative. Um, and a pedagogical partnership is a collaborative reciprocal process through which the teacher and student partners um, and have the opportunity to contribute equally, although not necessarily in the same ways to curricular or pedagogical conceptualization, decision-making, implementation, investigation or analysis. So we're excited to pilot that opportunity. If you're interested, please do let us know. Um, would love to hear from the panel. What recommendations do you have for educators who are seeking to shift from a traditional pedagogy to a more innovative approach? Where can they start? Um, Dr. Myers, can you start us off with your recommendations? Sure, I would say find your allies or like Bettina Love, your accomplishment accomplices, um, find your click, find your posse, find your crew, because um, it's not always an easy ride. I think sometimes in college, we share these um, critical pedagogies with our students and we're like, now go change the world. And we don't prepare them for the pushback that they might experience, that they probably will experience. And so, you know, if anyone's interested in kind of making that shift, Find other people who are um, doing the same kind of work, who can continue to pour their energy into you and share um, that. I know when I attended the um, Branch Ed Summit last month in New Mexico, I left just feeling refreshed because sometimes you feel a little beat down and it's nice to be able to work with other people who are doing the same types of things as you and to hear new ideas and to get really good critical feedback. Michaela, do you have something that you would share, something maybe that like a professor has done with you in class or something that you've seen a teacher out in the field do that you think would be really helpful? Yes, um, I know one of the things that we've done in our uh, methods class is asking the students, like starting with the student inventory, um, asking them um, their opinions and like keep track of it. And that way when you do get pushback, you know, the students ask for it, so I'm trying to help the student, and um, that also allows the teacher to get to know the student, what their needs are, and to create an inclusive classroom. Uh, Michaela and I are in Texas, where there is a lot of legislation right now um, being put on teachers and banning critical race theory and all these things. So they are anxious of how do I go into this field? So we talked a lot about, you know, making sure you're student centered and making sure that you just provide the space 
and the framework for students to have those conversations and that it's student led. I'd love to hear from other panelists around recommendations you have for educators who are seeking to shift from traditional pedagogies to in a, a more innovative approach. Or for um, Ms. Lockley, or if you're thinking about it um, next year as you join a classroom and lead a classroom of how you're thinking about it. How I'm thinking about it is that um, really and truly being able to be student standard because right now I'm with first graders and I love them, I love them. And there's a lot of things that they're not really getting taught. And it's like, okay, like here in a couple of years, you're gonna start having questions. And sometimes in my small group and even with the whole class, they'll start out the conversation and I'll just pull resources or really and truly a lot of books that I feel like will get them to that level. And that is something that me and other of the teacher candidates at UNCP and along with Dr. Tiffany, where we've included and we've talked about these things and how to actually include, you know, not having a watered down version and actually teaching what really happened and how to go about these things. Because, you know, the world is evolving and we have to be ready to come with it and share with our students and prepare them. Thank you, Leah. Um, one of the things that the state of North Carolina has done is they have they have formed the State Advisory Council on Indian Education. And one of the things that we created was a module. And that module teaches about the American Indians in the state of North Carolina. Um, it teaches about the eight tribes. And so we really encourage educators in the state of North Carolina to complete that module. Now that module is in power school. Right now I'm working on a way to get that professional development moved from power school to Canvas so that higher ed institutions um, can utilize and access that. Um, so that's one of the ways just being informed and, um, and it's okay to have these conversations, right? Um, it's okay for you to be uncomfortable sometimes and for me to be uncomfortable. That's how we grow, right? Um, and so um, that's one of the things that I recommend, really um, just becoming informed about, about your approaches and implementing, and, and it's okay to think outside the box and try, right? Um, one of the things I do in one of my ma um, math methods courses is I just bring out the manipulatives and I just put all these manipulatives on the students' tables and I just tell them to play. And they're like, really? And, and so it's just opening a space for them to, you know, um, and understand, hey, this is, you know, I don't like fractions, so I'm going to grab the fractions manipulatives and just play and begin to look at that. So there are so many ways um, that are simple and our teachers can just facilitate the solution. Um, our students have so much knowledge and allowing them to lead in a non-structured place brings about so much knowledge. You know, I think um, some of the recommendations um, I would make is to always give people um, permission to teach the truth. You don't need anyone's permission. You have to give yourself that permission to do that. Um, secondly, I think we really have to um, understand how to set up brave spaces for people to have difficult dialogues. I do like the Branch Ed um, Disorienting Dilemmas Project that our campus participated in. I mean, there are certain things that teachers are asked to teach. Um, I think they're giving a lot of responsibility with um, small amounts of authority. So I think we have to do a better job of connecting policy with practice. I know people mentioned the anti-CRT laws. There's been probably 120 laws in 35 states that have been passed um, since the murder of, of George Floyd. So we know that that narrative is out there, but again, you don't need ed code to teach the truth. I mean, we are not putting our political ideologies on students. We can just lay the information out there and let them decide um, for themselves. Um, obviously, there are several um, great reads out there. Dr. Tyrone Howard's book, Why Race and Culture Matter in, School, in Schools. I think that's a great pre-service and in-service text. It really does 
um, close the gap between pre-service and in-service. Um, Dr. Gloria, Gloria Bouti has a book, We Be Loving Black Children, just to give you an understanding of the African diaspora. And obviously, you know, Pedro, Dr. Pedro Nogueira City Schools and some of the things that he's done with his groundbreaking work are, are definitely some of the recommendations that, you know, I would offer up in this uh, space. We would love to open it to the community now. If you have questions uh, for the panel, um, you can put that in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll, we'll, we would love to um, discuss any questions that you have. So you can pop up that Q&A box and put in any questions you have for the panel. Um, Dr. Locklear and Leah, it's really exciting. As someone who lives in Charlotte, I get to see the ripple effects of some of the work you're doing um, at UNCP here in Charlotte, North Carolina with a kindergartner and a third grader. So we're excited to see some of those modules come to fruition here in Charlotte. And um, I know our teachers are really excited for those as well. Um, as we wait for our Q&A, um, if there's questions coming through from our audience, would love um, in each of our webinar series, one thing that stood out to me is our each panelist shared their own story and how it impacted them as a student and as a teacher. Um, what impact does reflecting sharing your own story have on you as an educator? I um, would love to, to put that out to the group. What impact does reflecting or sharing your story have on you as an educator? And why is this an important practice for all educators? Dr. Myers, can you start us off? Yeah, um, I, you know, for one, I think it helps take the shame away. Um, you know, a lot of us carry a little bit of shame because, you know, whatever it might be, our experiences, living in poverty, being a single mom, being first gen, not knowing our way around college and um, all those different things. I think when we share our story, it allows us to connect with others who maybe have similar stories um, that we didn't even realize that they had a similar walk as us. Um, and I think another part of it with sharing our stories is that our stories have power. And I know that Sonia Nieto talks about that a lot. Um, and you know, there's a line from um, Zora Neale Hurston's book. And um, I think it was Maya Angelou that said, if you don't tell your story, somebody else will. And so I think that it's important to remind our students that it's okay to share your story. It is difficult in higher ed to do that because um, I always joke that the F word in higher ed is feelings. And, um, you know, sharing our stories sometimes can make people uncomfortable when they hear about my experiences, when they hear that I've experienced gun violence firsthand and I have PTSD because of it. Um, it makes people very uncomfortable, um, but my story has power um, and I'm here because of my story. And um, I think that that's so important. And one of the courses that I teach is a graduate level course. And yes, we look at empirical studies, but we also use one of Paul Gorski's books that he edited about voices of diversity, where it is stories and poetry written by young people and by the educators who teach them. And so it's very narrative based. And um, that's been really powerful for my students to be able to read the stories and lived experiences of others. Thank you uh, to all of our panelists for sharing your stories and your reflections um, on this webinar series. And thank you to everyone out there for coming to our webinar series and um, thinking about these practices and how you can implement them 
in your own context. Um, well, this is the end of our webinar series. Do not fear. Uh, there are other ways you can engage with Branched. Um, you can uh, subscribe to our newsletter, keep an eye out on our website and all social media for upcoming Branch Ed events. Um, we would love to hear about, um, we would love to have you at any of our upcoming events. So just please keep an eye out to both of those or subscribe to our newsletter and it will come right to your inbox. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists for being here today um, and for our viewers we would love to hear about your experience today um, by taking this brief poll you should see it pop up on your screen And as we close out today, I just want to again thank all of our panelists for being here. Thank everyone for attending our webinar series and um, have a wonderful rest of the month and uh, end of the spring term. Thank you so much. <laughs>